Well, I hope you all brought your coats because in the next 18 minutes or less, we're gonna be climbing Mount Everest together. And what I wanna do is share with you some of the lessons I learned while serving as the team captain for the first American women's Everest expedition. Now, thanks, thanks. Don't tweet right now though, just a reminder. All right, the first thing I have to point out is that the route up Mount Everest is far from straightforward. You actually don't just climb from base camp to camp one to camp two. It's not nearly that easy. You're gonna spend about 10 days just hiking into base camp. Base camp is over 17,000 feet. And then you have to spend a few days at base camp getting used to the altitude. Now, once you spend a few nights at base camp, then you can climb up here to camp one and you spend the night here at camp one and then the next day you come back down here to base camp again. You're gonna spend a few nights at base camp again. Next day you climb up here to camp one and spend the night. Next day you climb up here to camp two and you spend the night at camp two. And then the next day, come all the way back down to base camp. Spend a few nights at base camp again. Climb up to camp one the next day, spend the night. Next day you're gonna climb up here to camp two, spend the night. Next day you're gonna spend about nine or 10 hours fighting your way up to camp three. You spend the night at camp three, it's almost 24,000 feet. And the next day, guess where you go? Yep, all the way back down to base camp. So the reason you have to keep coming back down to base camp is because you have to let your body get used to the altitude very slowly. It's this process called acclimatization. If someone were to magically drop you off on the summit of Mount Everest, if you could be dropped there by a plane or a helicopter or something like that, you would be dead in a matter of minutes from the altitude. So you have to move up this mountain really slowly so your head doesn't pop off when you get to the very top. I mean, it doesn't really pop off. Um, but the catch is that anytime you're above about 18 or 19,000 feet, which is any camp above base camp, Anytime you're above that elevation, your body is getting weaker and your muscles are starting to deteriorate. So it's this crazy catch-22 of wanting to spend time up high to get used to the altitude, but you have to keep coming back down low so you can eat, sleep, hydrate, and regain some strength. So not only is it very physically challenging to be going up and back down and up higher and back down again, but psychologically, it is super frustrating as well, just because intellectually you know that you want to be going this way, but you're spending a heck of a lot of time climbing in this direction. But what you have to remember is that even though you are going completely backwards, you're still making progress, right? Because you're helping your body acclimatize. And for some reason, we always think that progress has to occur in one particular direction. But that's just not the case. Sometimes you do have to go backwards in order to eventually get to where you want to be. This is just a shot of base camp on Mount Everest. Did anyone here see the movie Vertical Limit? Yeah, okay, well it's nothing like that. <laughs> there are no, uh, no keg parties or bonfires or s'mores. Uh, it's just a bunch of rocks and some tents. However, the first part of the route, once you leave base camp, has a lot going on. And this is where most of the accidents occur on Mount Everest. This area is called the Kumbu Icefall. The Kumbu Icefall is basically 2,000 vertical feet of these big, huge, moving ice chunks. These ice chunks are massive. They're the size of houses. And this icefall is in constant motion. So what happens is the sun comes up, everything starts to melt. These big, huge ice chunks start to shift around. So you are in constant danger of being crushed. Now it's made more complicated by the fact that there are all these big, huge open crevasses everywhere where you could fall hundreds of feet to your death. So they span these rickety aluminum ladders across them so you can go from one side to the other without falling in. So between the big, huge moving ice chunks and the ladders and the open crevasses, it is a very scary part of the mountain. But it's also where I learned one of the best lessons about climbing anything which is this, fear is okay. Fear is okay, you guys, it's just a normal human emotion. Complacency is what will kill you. You have to be able to react to the environment as things are shifting and changing. 
This is a shot of the team at Camp 2. I am five foot four. I was the tallest one. Yeah, we were so short we had to have these down suits custom made. Uh, but we liked them because we thought they were kind of flattering. <laughs> Here's a shot of the team heading up to Camp 3, up the steepest area of the route called the Lhotse Face. It's slick blue ice. You've got to watch every step. All right, I put this picture in because it's a totally fake smile. And I actually puked all over myself right before they took this shot. This is 24,000 feet on the Lhotse face. I had a banging headache, felt sick to my stomach. I had absolutely hit the wall. I did not have one ounce of energy left. And when you're on an expedition like this and you feel like you absolutely cannot go on, you have to dig down deep right, and pull out one of these. It's just like an energy gel thing, right? Uh, I like the chocolate flavor. It's got some caffeine in it. Suck this down and you're on your way because guess what? You're on Mount Everest. Like, you can't quit. You have a responsibility to the people around you. You've got to get out there, suck it up, and do what you're supposed to do. So you carry one of these things with you. It's way easier to carry than like a sports psychologist or something like that. All right, dealing with change. This is just what you get when you go to the mountains. Everything is always changing. It's all this stuff you cannot control. The weather's kind of an obvious thing that changes, but you've got other stuff too. You've got the weather, your health, the health of the team, the conditions of your gear, the conditions of the route, things going on with other teams. All of these things are always changing. You don't know what's going to happen from one minute to the next. So sometimes you look up at the summit of Mount Everest and it looks like this. It looks like, you know, it might be pretty approachable, but within a matter of minutes, a summit can look like that. That's really intimidating. But one thing you know about these storms is that they are always temporary. Storms are always temporary. There's just no such thing as a storm that lasts forever. But the key to getting through that is being able to take action based on the situation and not based on some plan. Because whatever plan you came up with last year, last month, last week, even that day, plan's outdated as soon as it's finished in an environment that's always evolving. So you've got to focus much more on executing rather than sticking to some plan. All right, this is a shot of our team heading up to the high camp. This is me at the high camp. You are more than welcome to borrow this picture and tell people it's you. <laughs> Nobody will ever know. All right, the high camp. It's at 26,000 feet on Mount Everest, also known as the death zone. They call it the death zone for a really good reason, and that's because at 26,000 feet, human life can no longer be sustained and your body is slowly starting to die. It starts to pull all the blood out of your fingers and toes and just focuses on keeping your core going, right? These vital organs, your heart, your lung, uh, your brain. At this elevation, you're taking five to 10 breaths for every step. So it looks like this. You would take a step and then you go. Five to 10 times before you do this. Take another step, five to 10 breaths again before you do this. Okay, so if you ever think you're having a slow day. <laughs> All right, so we get up to the high camp, we lay down for a couple of hours, 10.30 at night, we get out of our tent to start heading to the summit. Right? So it's 10.30, pitch dark, it's freezing cold, you wear, you wear a headlamp on your forehead, it's like a little flashlight so you can see down the trail. And I get out of my tent and I'm thinking, okay, we're at 26,000 feet. We need to be at 29,035 feet to be at the summit. Uh, that's more than 3,000 vertical feet alone that we need to cover. And I start doing the math, right? Like one step, five to 10 breaths, 3,000 plus vertical feet. And I start to get completely freaked out and intimidated thinking there's just no way. So the only way I could really wrap my brain around what we had to do was by breaking this down into smaller parts. And I took my headlamp and I just shined it on 
a rock that I could see down the trail. And I stared at the rock and I thought, all right, I just need to make it to that rock. That's all I need to do. I'm just going to that rock, right? Step, five to 10 breaths. Step again, five to 10 breaths. Before I knew it, I made it to the rock. Then I'd take my headlamp and I would shine it on, you know, a piece of ice, just anything else I could focus on. All right, I just need to make it there to that piece of ice. Step, five to 10 breaths. And I'd make it to the piece of ice. So every time I would think, Oh man, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. I would think, all right, well, I didn't think I could make it to that last landmark and I made it to that one. So maybe I could make it to one more. Maybe I could make it to one more after that. We climbed through the whole entire night that way. And by 6.30 in the morning, we were at a place called the South Summit, which is just below the true summit of Mount Everest. And at that point, storm clouds started to come in. So that's where we had to make a very tough call. So this is the summit of Mount Everest. This is about where we turned around to go down. Trust me when I tell you that turning around and walking away from the deal is harder then continuing on. But when you're up there in these mountains, you have to be able to make very tough decisions when the conditions around you are far from perfect. And you have to think about how every single move you make is going to affect everybody else around you and not just you. So it doesn't matter how much blood, sweat, and tears you put into something. If the conditions aren't right, turn around, cut your losses, and you walk away. Mount Everest is just a pile of rock and ice. You can always go back. But if you do something dumb up there, you may not have the opportunity to go back. And just so you know, too, it's just a couple hundred feet, but that would take us a few hours. No, you're shaking your head. You're like, you should have just like run and touch the top and run back down. You're taking five to, ten, five to 10 breaths for every step, right? So that was a few hours of climbing. We didn't feel like we had that much time left of a decent weather window. So spent two months on that mountain. That's where we called it quits. Game over, head back down to base camp. So people ask me all the time if I'd ever want to go back to Mount Everest. And I mean, typically my answer is always like, no, you know, I don't feel like after spending two months fighting my way up that mountain that I'm going to learn anything from going the last you know, few hundred feet. I mean, occasionally I'd get the urge to go back, and it was usually when someone was kind of giving me a hard time about the trip. And typically it would go down something like this. I would be at a dinner party or something, and the host of the party would be introducing me to the other guests. And he would say, this is my friend Allison. She climbed Mount Everest. And the guy across the table from me would go, oh, no way, all the way to the top? So then you have to say, well, no, actually, we, we turned around just a couple hundred feet from the top. Oh, so you didn't climb Mount Everest. And I was like, no, no, like I explained the whole thing. We were on that mountain for two months, and we were doing great, but it came down to a one bad you know, weather day, and that was it. We had to call it quits. And I gave him the whole spiel about getting to the top is optional. Getting down is mandatory. And he was like, I don't care. Like, if you weren't at the very top, like, if you didn't climb it, it doesn't count. I was like, OK, what do you do, tough guy? And uh, he, he actually worked for JP Morgan. So he said, he said oh, I, I work for JP Morgan. And I said, oh, no way. You're the CEO of JP Morgan? And he said, no, I'm, I'm not the CEO. I work in fixed income trading. I'm like, well, then. I guess you don't really work for JP Morgan then, do you? Because if you're not at the very top, then it doesn't count. And he's like, right, ah, that's totally different. But actually, I did end up changing my mind about going back because of my friend Meg. And it's a long story, but unfortunately, she passed away from a lung infection uh, at age 37 in 2009. And I wanted to do something to to honor her, so I went back to Mount Everest just last year, and I engraved her name on my ice axe, and I gave that mountain another shot. And that's me heading up over this area called the Geneva Spur on my way to the high camp. And then once I got up to the high camp, go figure, I look up, 
and there are the clouds coming right over the summit again. And I thought, I can't believe I am back here in the same spot eight years later with another storm coming in. And I thought, all right, I'm going to get out of my tent and just go part way. I don't think I'll get too far, but I at least have to put in a little effort here. So I started going toward the top, and the weather continued to deteriorate started to dump snow, the winds picked up, and I saw all these headlamps out there on the route coming toward me, which meant they were people that started out a little bit before I did that were turning around and aborting their summit bid and heading down. And I thought, I don't think that I'm gonna get too much further on this mountain, but I'm gonna just see what's gonna happen here. And you can see that the clouds did close in, visibility was absolutely horrible. It's a 10,000 foot drop on this side of the summit ridge and it's an 8,000 foot drop on that side. And again, I couldn't see too far in front of me, but sometimes I think you don't have to have total clarity in order to just put one foot in front of the other. So that's what I did. And I'm happy to report that on May 24th of just last year, eight years after my failed attempt, uh, I did make it to the summit of Mount Everest in honor of my friend Mag. Oh, thanks you guys. Thanks. Thanks. And for me, it was the completion of what's known as the Adventure Grand Slam, which is climbing the seven summits, the highest peak on each continent, and skiing to both the North and South Pole. And people ask me all the time what that felt like. You know, what did it feel like to fight your way up that mountain eight years later and go through everything that you've gone through and finally stand on that summit? What was that like? And I can honestly tell you, it just wasn't that big of a deal. <laughs> I mean, because come on, you guys, think about this for a second. It's, it's just a mountain, and you're only up there for a few minutes. So standing up there for a couple of minutes doesn't change anything. I mean, I was up there for 30 minutes, which was considered a long time. But I promise you that plenty of better, stronger, much more deserving climbers than I am didn't make it that day for whatever reason. And the people that stand on the top of that mountain are no better than the people who turn around just short of the top because the summit isn't important. What is important is the journey and the lessons that you learn along the way and how you're gonna use those lessons to be better and stronger on the next mountain. And I know I did my absolute best when I stood on the summit of Mount Everest last year on May 24th, but there are always gonna be more mountains to climb. So I know that going forward, I have to be even better. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to be a part of TEDx. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so much.